Hey guys, today I'm going to be talking about this gun that was brought back from World War II by Bob Macklin, along with this flag that was brought back and signed by many of the guys in his unit. Okay, this is the gun that was brought back and Bob Macklin's name is in here. Now, I already did a short, or a, what I call a quickie, what YouTube calls a short. And I just wanted to explain uh, that we started doing shorts because we were told that it really helps um, YouTube promote their channel. They're competing with TikTok and so they take the TikTok model and they say, hey, let's do our own TikTok and they call it a short. So we've been putting out shorts and it's just a quick tease. Uh, either that or we put out something funny and it's only like 15 to 60 seconds. Uh, but it has really helped promote our channel and get, we've brought in a lot of new viewers. So if you're a new viewer, first of all, thank you. I hope you can like and subscribe to our channel. But this is what I normally do, educational videos about uh, World War II guns or other eras and especially guns that were brought back by our vets. Now, this flag you can see right here, um, he, this is uh, just basically a quote uh, that he put on here. And this is his name, and actually uh, Bob was from Texas in the 90, 99th Infantry Division. At some point, they had a reunion, I can tell, because this was not issued in World War II. Obviously, this is a reunion, and, and there was a lot of different association. Uh, that's the uh, emblem for the 99th Infantry Division. We'll hear a little bit more about his service. And I got a boatload of pictures here. I, I will go through some of these, but there's a, a lot of pictures, including uh, potentially a picture of the German officer he took the uh, pistol from, uh, and then postcards from Germany. So we want to go through some of that, but let's start with the uh, gun itself. Now, this is a Model 1922. Uh, made by FN Browning, you can see right here. So this is a Belgian pistol, and they were very, uh, Belgium was very famous for their pistols, made some of the finest pistols in the world, and uh, especially the uh, high power, which was revolutionary at its time, but the uh, Browning high power, very popular. But when the Germans uh, took over Belgium in World War II, beginning of World War II, they took over the factory, just like they did with all the occupied countries, and they began to make pistols for their own army and armed forces. Uh, these have Waffen stamps. It'll have an uh, Eagle N stamp, which was the firing proof, but this also has, there's a firing proof. It has a 140 proof, uh, which here's a Eagle proof here, very tiny. Uh, and this one is in remarkable condition. They almost always have these wooden grips or uh, plastic Bakelite grips. Uh, this is in incredible condition. The earliest ones came in 9mm, but the Germans preferred 7.65. As you probably know, many of the uh, sidearms, uh, the smaller sidearms like the HSC, the Sauer 38, 38H, the Walders, uh, most of them were 7.65. And some of these were a favorite of the Luftwaffe, and the only way you can tell they went to the Luftwaffe is the holster it came in. Um, so I, I see a lot of these, uh, many of the 1922s will come in, I lift off a holster, here's actually a picture of one, and usually on the back or in the inside, sometimes in the inside it'll be ink stamped, it'll have a Luftwaffe Eagle, um, or on the back it'll have a Luftwaffe Eagle on the back of the holster. Uh, this one is kind of a ubiquitous holster. Uh, that is a big word because part of my goal is to improve your vocabularies. Uh, that's a joke, by the way. Uh, ubiquitous just means uh, everybody had one. This is just a utility holster that probably came with several different pistols, but it does uh, fit this pistol just fine. And not 100% sure it was issued with this, but his name is right here, Bob Macklin, and his GI number. That's the only reason we were able to look him up and figure out, well, who is this guy and how did he get his, this pistol? Uh, we don't know a whole lot, uh, but I'm going to make a, a few conjectures here. So this first set of pictures you can see, uh, first of all, we assume this is Bob. Um, I believe he has the name on the back, but uh, this is Bob Macklin. And then there's a picture of some of the guys in his unit. Uh, and then a little later on, we see a picture of a German officer. Now, according to the person that I bought this from, uh, as told by the family, that was the, um, that was the officer he took the pistol from. Of course, I can't prove that. Uh, 
But it, it would make sense. I don't know why else he has a picture of a German officer. Uh, this is obviously probably after the, after the surrender because uh, this looks very relaxed and you typically wouldn't say, hey, can I take your photograph? So I'm assuming it was a friendly handover or a friendly surrender, not something that happened in the midst of war. But again, it's only conjecture. Um, obviously, people will have differing opinions. And then we just see different pictures of Germany. We see uh, destroyed uh, tanks um, and just different pictures with him and some of his GI buddies. And then also, uh, he w it must have been there after the war, which is when I think after the war was over, he, he got a, this pistol and brought it back. Uh, but we'd see a lot of these postcards, ubiquitous <laughs> postcards. Um, just loved improving my vocabulary. Ubiquitous uh, postcards from Germany that many of the GIs brought home after the war. Uh, and then the other piece, uh, besides the gun, which is, the, uh, to me, the most outstanding part. Oh, by the way, look at this front, front strap and back strap. It, almost nowhere. So this officer did not use the pistol very much. Maybe we can tell from his cap um, what branch of service. I'm sure somebody will look at the picture and tell me what branch of service uh, this German soldier was in. Um, but if we, let's take a look at the flag itself. Now again, he, uh, he probably brought this home because he's the only one that had uh, this inscription and he put uh, that it was from the 99th uh, Infantry Division. Everybody else just signed their name. As we look through the, the names after we get past uh, Macklin's name, you can see just all the different places around the, around the country. We see uh, New York and Kentucky. Here's Pops. Every, some people had a nickname. Um, they all uh, printed their names. So this was not done on the battlefield. This was, I think, done at a uh, reunion. Uh, here's a fellow Texan. Uh, because uh, Bob was from Texas, and I saw one from right near my hometown. I saw one, I can't, I don't see it right now, but we have Ohio, Kensington, PA, that's not too far from us, but the one that really stuck out, here's Philadelphia, I'm not thinking of that one. There was one here from Downingtown, PA, which is really just a couple miles uh, west of where we are right now. Uh, some of you are going to see people from, from your town. Here's Indiana, Pittsburgh, PA, Lexington, South Carolina, New York. You see people from all over the United States. Here's a guy from Chicago and Michigan. Um, so obviously all guys from the 99th Infantry Division, if you read about them, uh, they were heavily involved uh, in combat. And I do have the obituary from Bob and just wanted to go through that. Robert, or Bob Macklin, uh, passed away at 92 years of age back in October of 2015. Now, he uh, went to Texas A&M in the fall of 1941. So if you think about the fall of 1941, you know that uh, very early into the semester by December, uh, Pearl Harbor was bombed. And if you live in Texas, by the way, just let some of you foreigners know, don't mess with Texas. If you're in Texas and the United States is attacked, uh, you know uh, pretty much everybody in his class immediately signed up uh, to serve their country. And so right after Pearl Harbor, uh, Bob served for four years in the U.S. Army. Um, and he served in the 99th Infantry Division, which we already knew. He was involved in the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, Bob was uh, awarded uh, several medals, including three bronze stars. After World War II, Bob returned to Texas A&M, where he graduated in 1948 in agriculture. And then uh, throughout his life, he, he served on several boards and government agencies, U.S. public health, but uh, mostly related to uh, agricultural industry uh, throughout our country. The only picture of uh, what I think is Bob is, is very tiny and hard to see. Um, other than that, we have the picture uh, from his obituary when he was obviously a much older man. But to Bob and the other guys who signed their name to this flag, thank you for your service. Okay, my favorite videos are of the Vet Bring Back, so I hope you enjoyed that one. But I also got an eclectic assemblage of guns coming in. How's, how's that for vocabulary? You go back and tell your wife, I learned so much from this video. An eclectic assembly 
of guns. Uh, from the Mac Show, and also while I was at the Mac Show, I got some guns in that are pretty cool, so I'm just gonna show them to you really quickly. This is the first one, a Walder PP, but it's special. Okay, you do see the high polish finish. It's just absolutely gorgeous. On the front strap though, it is marked RJ, uh, which we know stands for Reich's Justice. So that's the Justice Department. Now, it was controversial in the Nazi era. Um, it's controversial now, but no political comments, please. Um, during the Nazi era, the uh, Reich's Justice, that was uh, the Justice Department, they were in charge of arre arresting bad people and uh, putting them on trial. So this would be court guards. Uh, I'm told that even the magistrates or judges uh, carried a pistol under their robe. Uh, so these went to the Justice Department and they do command a premium because of their history. This one is in really good condition. This is the finger extension mag, of course, magazine and it's in 7.65. This one also came in, which is a Walder PPK. The condition of this one is absolutely stunning. Um, beautiful finish. This one is a, a pre-war model because from the serial number, I can see that it was about 1938. It has Crown and Proust, 1938, so just before the war started. And it was made for export. That is not an import mark but it was made for export. In other words, Germany made this probably to go to the United States. This is original factory, and it tells me that it was meant to go to a retail store. We're not sure, it could have been A.F. Stoger. And the reason I say that is I've had other Walders, both PPs and PPKs, it'll say made in Germany, and then over here it'll say A.F. Stoger, or there was also one on the West Coast, I wanna say Pacific Arms. Um, but they, they did a special order for that retailer where they, um, they did a checkering there just a, as part of the, the grip. It just gave you a better grip. So that was a special order from the factory, and this was factory applied. This, that makes this a very rare and desirable Walther PPK. This model is a small 32 caliber pistol. Actually, right under here, it says 7.65 BM. I'm not sure what BM, it probably means uh, bowel movement. I don't know. Um, BM may be Bohrden model. Um, not sure, but what makes this so rare is it's a dual aluminum. Basically, it means it's an aluminum frame, and you can see, um, actually, the slide is marked uh, dual aluminum, and the frame is marked dual aluminum. Uh, the barrel would be steel, and you can see where the frame meets the barrel, there is a line. Uh, when I've shown you PPKs like this, uh, this is white metal, so it's white aluminum. This is not a missing pin. This pin probably just needs to be pushed through a little bit. I have this tiny magnet here, and sometimes it's deceptive because when I go like that, you say, oh, look at that, it sticks, so it's not aluminum. But in case you buy a gun like this and say, hey, Legacy lied to me, that's not aluminum. That's because this is a metal magazine. So we take out the magazine. This is nickeled magazine. And now we put this up here and it's probably gonna fall on the floor. Up oh, there it goes. Now this is the first one I've ever seen. Actually the first one I've ever um, handled. Uh, now this model I mentioned is a Behorden. The differences between this and a 1913. 1913 is a lot more common. So if you know the Sauer uh, 19, model 1913, you think it looks exactly like it. The differences are the cocking knob, the sirations go all the way across, uh, extend all the way across, and also there's an extra safety right here. But this is a safety and then this is a safety as well. Uh, you just cock it like that and then you can fire, which I don't like to do because people yell at me um, through the internet. Uh, you can see this is nickeled, uh, just a beautiful gun, extremely rare. They do have firing proofs. You do see a crown in on, on the back here, which is also where they have it on the 1913. It's on the um, frame as well and on the barrel. So it has those proofs. This is a cute little small pistol. Uh, with a spare, there is a spare magazine here, but what the heck is it? Let's open this up, wipe it off because it's got smudgies on it. And this is probably the nicest Model 4 I've ever seen in my life. These were made in the 1914 to about 1918 era. And most of the ones that you see are pretty beat up. They actually were um, issued to some officers. This one was not because it doesn't have the Imperial proof here. 
It just has the uh, crown end proof. But if you look at the front strap, the back strap, even the magazine, uh, it is Walther marked on the bottom, by the way. Walther Model 4, you know, hardly used. And when I first saw it, I, I had to say, is this, is this thing been redone? But you can tell from the finish, you just get to know this early Walther blue. You can tell from the extractor that that shows age. And overall, there's a little bit of patina, but again, um, easily the nicest Walther 4, Walther Model 4 I've ever seen. And the extra bonus is the cute little holster. Uh, this is obviously a P38, would seem unremarkable, but it's noteworthy. As soon as you see this cog hammer, the wider striations, I can't say that word, so my vocabulary is not that good. I especially can't speak German. But uh, this cog hammer is late war, and when we try to figure out how late, we do see uh, AC45, AC is Walder, 45 is the year, and it's in the C block. Now the C block is the last ones that they made. Um, by the D block, they were being put together by the, the um, vets who took over the factory in, in April, actually pretty early April. So this one was probably made like the first week of April and put together um, by slave labor. They were most likely Polish forced laborers. You can see how rough it is. The finish is rough, but it is all matching. Just look at the numbering on the barrel. It is so crude. People would say, oh, that's got to be fake. No, it was just done very hurriedly and very sloppy. And the reason they were hurrying is because they were telling the Polish workers, work faster or else, and they could hear the artillery uh, exploding in the background as the American army was coming up over the hill. So this literally was made in the last days of the war, and then the guns after this C block were all put together by the GIs. Well, actually, they paid the Polish workers to put them together, and they put some together, but generally they um, took over the, the GIs took over the factory and were making them to bring home as souvenirs. It only has two proof marks. It doesn't have the final proof, which means it was in the factory, probably when the GIs came in, was put together um, under German occupation, but soon thereafter it was, we call it liberated. Other people use other words. Uh, notice the dual tone finish. This is phosphate. This is phosphate. I think the magazine and the, the um, mag release, that's all phosphate. This uh, magazine, U-marked, which means unhardened. Uh, 1945 uh, phosphated mag, just uh, a remarkable P38. It might look ugly to you, but it's very rare and very historical. Here's one that I picked up at the Mac Show. Uh, by the way, Mac Show attendance was extremely light, especially on Saturday. It was a bit disappointing. Just wanted to be honest with you. SOS, the show in Kentucky, um, is a lot better attended. The Mac Show, maybe it's the location, I I'm not sure, but. Uh, it was very poorly attended, and I just want to put that out there because I know people ask me to recommend shows. But I did pick up this uh, artillery Luger. Uh, what, what makes this a little bit more rare is made by Erfurt in 1914. Now, most of the uh, artilleries, most of the Lugers were made by DWM. Most of you know that. Um, Erfurt only made them in 1914, only made about 20,000 of them, but they only made them one year. DWM made them from 1914 all the way to 1918. There's a lot more of them. Uh, so again, uh, rare maker, um, artillery Luger. In, uh, it's got a dulled finish, but it is original finish. For those of you who ask, it does have halos around the serial number there. That's something you look for. It does not have a matching mag, but it is a correct magazine. And it does have this, this uh, correct artillery holster. This is an original artillery holster. And you'll notice it doesn't have straps that you put it on your belt, but rather they carried it over their shoulder. I know Randy will find a picture of uh, the World War I. This would be World War I soldiers uh, carrying their artillery holster. This, by the way, is dated 1917, so it was, it was uh, from the World War I era. I'm going to show you one more, although there's a lot more to show you, but I know that uh, some of you need to go do, help your wife do the dishes, um, so I'll let you go. But uh, stay tuned. Make sure you like and subscribe, because I got a bunch more guns to show you, and these are just all very remarkable. This is a Krigov. 
You know how you can tell? Because it says Kragoff right there. That anchor is uh, the logo. It doesn't mean it went to the Navy. In fact, these, uh, almost all of them uh, went to the Luftwaffe. That's actually a Luftwaffe acceptance stamp. Uh, there's three of them here in a row. I do discuss this in my book on Third Reich Lugers. You do see the date of 1937. Uh, they do come in nine millimeter. Only the there's a couple. There's just a few commercial guns that were made, and some of them were made in 30 caliber. But by far, most of them are, were made in nine millimeter. This one happens to have a matching magazine. You can see here uh, 7873, and here 7873, and the uh, Krigoff proof mark. Uh, one thing about this one, well, first of all, with the finish, you can see that it's high polished finish. I call this the ear. So the rim around the ear is high polished, but it's a matte finish in the middle. When these are redone, then you'll see, they're, they're basically, the whole thing will be a glossy finish. Same thing over here, you can see the ear, it's kind of a matte finish, high gloss finish on the rail around, and then a matte finish through here. Uh, this is blued. And this is a straw finish. Uh, it's a very light straw. Uh, sometimes the straw is darker, but I, I'm suspecting uh, this was not restrawed, but I, I think somebody just used a rag to polish it off because the straw finish does come off a lot easier than the blued finish. I just hope you're exuberant about our video today. Uh, and there's more to come, so make sure you like and subscribe, and we'll be right back.